Hi, it's time for a chime video. So on the workbench today, we have two identical door chimes. Well, these are parts of door chimes. They haven't all been put back together fully yet. These are both new tone model LA 305 WL door chime control units. We don't see a lot of these because these were relatively new. These are now a discontinued model. In this case, we have two of them here and they were both sent in by the same fella. So first, a little bit of explanation. These are not actually new tone door chimes. These are actually Brone door chimes. These were made prior to the time that the parent company that owns Brone purchased Newtone. And these chimes are a revamp or knockoff version or perhaps a ripped off version of a much earlier Rittenhouse door chime. They are physically larger, different, but the basic fundamental design came out as a Rittenhouse door chime all the way back in the mid 1970s. Like a lot of things, Rittenhouse went out of business. I assume their patents ended and the designs that they have were free and fair to be copied and used, which is exactly what Brown did. At some point, they transformed the model number into new tone model numbers. And we get calls from people. It's like, I have a new tone door chime. It's an LA305. And it's like, immediately my first reaction is that's not a new tone chime because it's not. Anyway, why do we have two of these here? We have two of these here because, and these are both brand new. They're not more than you know, they were installed for less than 20 minutes, brand new. And the story behind this is that some lady was having work done on her house and she really, really, really liked this style of door chime. And she found two of them because they're discontinued, so they're a little hard to find. And she paid a fair amount of money for them, probably 300 and fifty dollars a piece and hired some fellow or some fellow working on the job or whatever it was to put them up and he promptly and immediately blew both of them up because he didn't read the instructions that came with them and hooked them up incorrectly and burn up components on the circuit board. Not good. Uh, there's a reason why they put those papers in the box with things and it has, the papers have writing on it. And on the top it says installation instructions and it tells you how you have to hook it up. Now these are an interesting design, which we'll get to in a minute. But first, before we do that, let's talk about what kind of chimes these actually are. So here's the uh, tube and base assembly. Nice three shiny brass tubes. This is the plate where the circuit board will get reinstalled and you've got three tone bars. These are eight note chimes. These are eight note short tube bar chimes. They're bar chimes because they have tone bars. The brass tubes are resonators that have openings in them. So these work just like the hole in a guitar body to help amplify the sound that the tone bars make. These are not tubular chimes because they have tone bars. Also, these are eight note chimes. These are not or should not be referred to as Westminster chimes because Westminster chimes have to have four distinctively different notes in them. And these chimes only have three notes because there's only three tone bars. Each of these is a different note. So they're not Westminster chimes. It's an eight note bar chime because it's eight notes. One of the notes gets played twice and it sort of is a faux Westminster chime. How about that? The fella who blew these up contacted me and said, and the story is a little on the sketchy side and all the information doesn't always exactly line up because sometimes guys don't like to explain how they did something wrong. Anyway, he blew up one and then apparently he blew up the second one, probably installing it incorrectly in exactly the same way as he did the first one amazingly enough. He said he wanted to send them to me to have me repair them. And I said, that would be fine. We can do that for you. So he took both of them and they were all assembled as complete chimes on their bases and everything. And he basically crammed them into a box. And yes, this video is me griping a little bit because it's not a rant video exactly, but it probably should be. He crammed them in a box. He didn't package them up very well. He didn't do much to protect them or anything. And both of them showed up with broken circuit boards. This corner here on the top of each board, this one here and that one there were both broken off and they were broken off from the hole that goes through the board where this little 
connector is down at a diagonal angle down to there and was snapped off and floating around down inside the box. That kind of thing just annoys the hell out of me because it doesn't take much to package things up well enough to make sure they make the trip in one piece. So I did what I normally do. I took pictures of it. I edited the pictures with arrows and pointed at the broken part and the little piece lying on the table next to it and sent them to him and said, due to insufficient packaging, both chimes showed up with broken circuit boards and we will do what we can to fix it so they're usable again. Fortunately on these, there's only one circuit trace that goes across the brake, although it does go into where the screw connects because there is a connection pad under the screw here. So that's a thing. The biggest problem with this is that it's on the corner and it's unsupported. The mounting screw that holds it to the mounting base is right there. So this part is just floating when it sits on the base. And it's just ripe for getting broken again when it gets reinstalled or messed around with or whatever it is. So something has to be done to make it strong enough so it won't break again in the future. But before I did that, the proper thing to do was to repair the board to make sure that we could actually repair it and then operate it to make sure it works correctly before we go through the effort to fix the brake. Both of them had blown up components because that's what happens when you hook things up incorrectly. The other thing I noticed about these boards is that I don't know what company actually manufactured these boards for Brone, but whatever the company is, they're just sloppy as heck. They're sloppy boards. The board is kind of big for what's on it. You know, it's lot of unused space and I assume that was done to make it fit into the chassis so the cover had a place to hang and that's a design choice but the quality of the construction of the board is very poor in fact one of the telltale signs of that is for instance there's all these like resistors and things all over the board and diodes and stuff they're all very poorly placed most of them the leads are way too long and they're sitting up off the boards and the leads are kind of looped over and it's just really sloppy so this was built down to a price they probably went with whatever the low price vendor was to make this board and there's not a lot of attention to detail and it's kind of disappointing because it's no reason for that you know the difference between a well laid out and a well manufactured board and this it's you're probably talking about a dollar and something difference per board there is a term in the world of electronics which is built down to a price and that's what this actually is, built down to a price. That being said, I also found it interesting that there are two integrated circuits, one here and one there. And these are the same integrated circuits that were used in the Rittenhouse chimes all the way back in the mid 1970s. So things don't change all that much. And this board, for the most part, if you compare this with a Rittenhouse board, which I don't have one in the shop at the moment, it's almost exactly the same. It's spread out more and, and some of the components are different because it's not 1975 anymore, but it's pretty much just a complete ripoff of the original design, which means it was a good enough design to make it last that long. So there was that. So I repaired both boards. They both work completely now. And after I did that, that was yesterday afternoon, it was time to do something with the corners. So what I did was, you can see here, the crack goes diagonally from under the screw down this way. So what I did was I very carefully pushed the corner of the fiberglass board material back together and lined it up correctly. Under the screw here, there's a hole where the screw goes through and a round solder pad. I temporarily bridged the brake with some solder and then took some really, really, really fine wire and made a loop and soldered the loop all the way around the solder pad around the hole to help reinforce it. And then here where the trace went across the brake, I very carefully scraped off the green solder mask, flowed a little solder onto the bare copper trace and used some desoldering wick like this. It's desoldering wick. It's a copper braid that you use when you desolder components sometimes. Desoldering wick is a really good reinforcement because it's a woven 
copper mesh and that was soldered across the brake to give it some reinforcement and that was mostly to hold it in place that's not the the bridge here and the wire around the pad under the screw that's not good enough because the corner would still be really really wobbly and you don't want that because when somebody's putting this in if they press on it or if they have to tighten the screw down and they push too hard to the screwdriver they're going to crack it and then it's going to come loose again and then it's not going to work after I did that, I took a piece of project board like this, also referred to as perf board usually. It's just a piece of fiberglass board with holes in it and copper pads on the back. And I cut out two pieces, one for each of the appropriate sizes, and then sort of sanded the edges down and made it fit properly. And you can see them here on the back. They're right here. Put them in place, make sure they fit properly, make sure I could get the connector and the screw back on correctly, and mix up some two-part epoxy and epoxied it in place and held it overnight with a spring clamp like this to make sure it dried well and you need the clamping pressure for it to really become strong. And now, electrically, it's repaired and physically, it's very, very strong. You would have to make a really concerted effort, break it again, because the piece that's been epoxied on the back is bridging over the brake as much as humanly possible because you've, you're limited a little bit by the screw here and this capacitor over here, but it's more than strong enough and it shouldn't be a problem in the future. So I did that repair on each of them. That one's a little bigger because the brake went down a little further. That all worked out pretty well. This morning, I had both boards working yesterday, and this morning, when I took it apart, cleaned up the oozy epoxy where it oozed out under the board a little bit, and then hooked them both up again to make sure they still work correctly, which they do. And then another aspect of these boards is you might notice that there are these two 9-volt battery clips coming off the back of the board. And this is actually a clever design, and it's a clever design from the days of Rittenhouse back in the mid 1970s because they were the first company to come up with this idea that I'm aware of. And that was a long time ago, 1975 or so. This type of chime is often referred to as a four wire chime because you need two wires from the transformer to these two terminals to supply constant power to the circuit board to keep everything turned on and working. And then two wires from the push button on the front porch, which connect up to this screw and this screw for the front, this is rear, this is side. So two wires for power, two wires for the push button, for a total of four wires. Not every house has four independent wires where the door chime is located inside the house. If your house was built with a standard two note mechanical doorbell, the kind that goes ding dong, the wiring is oftentimes done differently and that you only have two wires sticking out of the hole in your sheetrock inside your house. That won't work with this type of chime unless you bought one of these and it's got the battery clips. And it has different connections on it based on how it's going to be installed. And this was a mistake that the fella who blew both of these up made because, oh wait, he didn't read the instructions which is what he should have done. These two wires are when you have a dedicated direct wire transformer to power the chime. This screw is used when you have only two wires coming out of your wall and you're gonna use the battery connections to power the circuit board. So the way this works is the two nine volt batteries here, like these, two Duracells. You put the Duracells like this, that one, and that one. Now, this board is now powered by the two Duracell batteries. This board is actually on right now. It's ready to go. But you need a connection between the, trans the original transformer that powered the two note ding dong doorbell, which would go, one lead goes here, and then the button wires go through these that activate the plungers. So the batteries power the electronics and the original doorbell transformer that was put in your house when it was built for the two note ding dong doorbell power the solenoids to make it strike the tone bars. It's a good design. It was done originally, I'm pretty sure, 
because it opened up the ability of more people in buying a chime like this back when Rittenhouse used to make them. Of course, that gives you a bigger market share and you can sell more chimes and that's always a good thing. So it's a clever design and it's something that still was made today. These are all discontinued now. Newtone doesn't make any chimes like this at all anymore. So that's a done deal. Anyway, that's sort of the story of these two LA305s. And now I'm gonna put them back together here. And then I'll be back once I get that done and you can actually hear what they sound like. So we have our two Newtone LA503s reassembled. No small feat. Putting the tone bars back in are a real pain in the neck, the way they're designed. Once you figure it out, it's not that bad. And I suppose after I've done, I don't know, 100 of them it'll be easier so rear door side door front door eight notes and you have a little switch here which you can switch it to four notes That one works well. I'm gonna switch them around, do the second one. I'm gonna show the second one with the batteries. All right, this is chime number two. It's got the two nine volt Duracells powering the circuit board. I'm gonna hang them off on the back. You'll notice here the wire connections are different. I only have one power lead here connected on the very first terminal. The second power lead here has a alligator clip wire on it and it's turned on. So we'll go ahead and single note. Second single note. And eight notes. And we can flip it up to four notes. And that's what it does. Turn the power off. One of the things I noticed on these, and I think it's the way they come when they're brand new, is here on the tone bars, here, here, and here, you can see this is tape residue. And because of the way these tone bars float on their grommets, they're not really grommets, they're rubber insulators, I guess, and the way they fit down inside the resonators down there, they're very floppy, which is required so you get a decent note out of them. But I think with shipping and everything, if the boxes get thrown around, they're all going to pop loose. And I think that's why it had tape across it to hold them in place. You can see there's tape residue here on the side of this bracket and on the side of this bracket here. So I think that was done when it was packaged to keep them in place, which is what I'm going to do when I send them back to the guy. So that's a little bit of information about the quote, Newtone LA305s. The last two digits, LW, they were RWs. It has to do with the finish of the cover. And I'll try to find a picture that I can post here and you can see what they look like with the cover on. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps for someone it will be helpful. If it is, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube because that helps us just a little bit. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell. And when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications. And every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.